All right, here we go. So we're going to talk today about um, foul recognition. Um, so as we cover this, there's a couple of things. Um, we'll start with just some basic instruction, things to be thinking about uh, when we're dealing with, with foul recognition. Um, then we'll do some video analysis, and then we'll have some general Q&A time at the end. So if you have any questions that aren't specific to a topic or a video that we're watching right now, then uh, just go ahead and hold off and we'll do a general Q&A at the end um, so that anybody who has questions can get them answered. So we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, when we talk about foul recognition, um, we're first going to start talking about the FIFA considerations. Um, if you've not heard of this before, I would encourage you to go and look this up online when we're done here. Um, if you Google FIFA considerations, you'll come up with the document we're looking for. The, the formal title of it is called Analysis of Match Situations Considerations. This is a document that FIFA put together. It's about six pages long that is basically a series of questions. And it's a series of questions that referees should ask themselves and get familiar with uh, to assist with decision making. Uh, and so as we go through this, we're going to talk about the FIFA considerations. I'll go through the ones that are relevant to, uh, to this evening's sem uh, seminar, and then we'll, we'll use them in practical application when we're watching videos. And then when we get into discussing actual foul recognition, we're going to break that up between lower body fouls and upper body fouls so that we are um, reviewing the finer points and details of those two very different kinds of contexts. So first, we get into the FIFA considerations. Uh, again, this is a document that uh, FIFA put together. Um, if you're on a computer screen where you can separate and still see this uh, and pull it up, you're welcome to do so. I am gonna give us eight of the considerations that are the most uh, relevant for our discussion this evening. We'll go through those here in a second. But the, the whole purpose of the FIFA considerations is to assist referees in decision-making. Um, referees at the top level have used this document for a long time. They're very familiar with it. And the questions that they have to ask themselves are sort of just bred into them by this point because they've been using it for so long. So we're going to go through eight of them, all of them, which are considerations that we need to be thinking about for every foul decision that we make. Um, obviously, we don't want to sit and ask ourselves eight questions before we blow the whistle on a foul. Um, some are relevant to, to individual fouls, some are not. But the basic premise is these are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about when, when we're, we're going through the decision-making process on challenges. So the first one is, does the player show a lack of attention or consideration when making his challenge? Um, FIFA uses the, the proper him for all of this. I want to make sure we're clear that it's him or her, obviously. Um, but does the player show a lack of attention or consideration when making his challenge? So that's the first thing we need to be thinking about. Um, the second, oops, sorry, I was clicked out of there for a second. The second is, does the player act without precaution when making the challenge? So when the player goes in to make the challenge, are they not taking into consideration their opponent at all? Are they taking any precaution when making a challenge? Does the player make fair or unfair contact with the opponent after touching the ball? So this is an important one, and we're going to dive into this a little bit more deeply with some of the videos. Um, but fair or unfair contact is fair or unfair, regardless of if the ball has been touched or not. And that's something I really want to hammer home tonight. Um, so does the player make fair or unfair contact with the opponent after touching the ball? And does the player act with complete disregard of the danger to his opponent? So when making the challenge, is there any consideration whatsoever for any potential danger to the opponent when making the challenge? Those are the first four. I'm gonna leave that there for a minute. For those of you on computers, take a picture of it um, so that you can look at it when, uh, when we're going through uh, uh, some of the clips later on. I'm gonna leave this up here for a second. Um, the big one I wanna harp on again is the fair or unfair contact with the opponent after touching the ball. Um, we're going we're gonna to see a couple examples of that, and I want to make sure that we're clear that touching the ball uh, isn't licensed to do whatever you want after that. Unfair contact is still unfair, even if you touch the ball first. All right, I'm going to need five more seconds, and I'm going to move on from this screen. Okay, the next set of considerations. Does the player act with a complete disregard of the consequences for the opponent? So again, you're hearing a, a common thread here. Um, any consideration for the danger, any consideration for the uh, consequences. 
if a player flies into a challenge with complete disregard, we need to be thinking about that. Because whether they win the ball or not, even if they don't touch the opponent, if the challenge is made with a complete disregard for the consequences to the opponent, that needs to be something we consider an unfair challenge. Does the player have a chance of playing the ball in a fair manner? This is a little bit different way of looking at this. Was there even an opportunity for the player to play the ball in a fair manner? Um, you know, if the ball's five yards away and a guy goes flying into a challenge, was there even any opportunity to play the ball fairly? These are things we need to be thinking about when we're making decisions. Is the challenge putting an opponent in a dangerous situation? So does a challenge create potential danger for an opponent? Again, there's some similarity in these that we're seeing. And lastly, does the player touch the ball after making contact with the opponent? So again, when fair or unfair challenge is considered, if a player touches the ball after making contact with the opponent, something we need to be thinking about. Again, if you hit the opponent first, almost always that's gonna be a foul. Any questions on these eight considerations before we move on and start talking about the specific nature of uh, lower body challenges first? So again, feel free to hit the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen or type your question into the chat or the question and answer section and we'll be able to answer it. Stuart, if you get any typed ones, just go ahead and read them to us. Sounds good. Any questions on this before we move on and, and analyze some lower body challenges? You, you are muted. The question is, are we muted? But you do have, if you raise your hand at the bottom, we'll know to unmute you so you can answer, ask a question. And Stuart, if you can unmute people, that would be great as they raise their hands. Absolutely. Question, can we get a copy of this PowerPoint? Absolutely. And again, you'll have a video of it on our YouTube channel. Okay. okay, anything else? You're my um, eyes, Stuart. I'm not looking at the question. No worries. So. Is okay. it not hard to judge complete disregard? Is question word for word. Um, sure, absolutely. Sometimes it can be, but um, you know, sometimes we can look at the outcome, sometimes we can look at the way a challenge is being committed. Um, and we'll break down in some detail uh, in future webinars and more advanced webinars the kinds of factors we need to be thinking about, be it speed, distance from the ball, when the player starts the challenge. There's one video we'll look at tonight where we can analyze that question a little bit more. So let's put a pin in that one. And when we get to the specific video I'm, I'm thinking of, we'll talk about it in more detail. Okay. Oh, we have, do have one more raised hand. We'll try to get to. So Michael Suggs, if you could unmute yourself by hitting the thing in the bottom left. Yeah, hi, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Yeah, my, my question is, um, how important is it where the player uh, that commits the potential foul, where they're looking? So, for example, if they're following the ball, but perhaps make an erratic play at the ball because they didn't see where the other player was, uh, how much does that go into account? You know, that's a factor for misconduct, not for the actual foul. So if contact is fair, then it's not a foul. And we'll get into the details of that. If it's unfair contact, it's still a foul. What you're getting into is intent. Um, is the player looking at the ball the whole time and unaware of the player? Does that factor into potential misconduct? Yes, it can. Um, but we're more focused right now on, on judging foul and, 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 or excuse me, fair and unfair challenges. Uh, and so we're gonna put a pin in that until we talk more about misconduct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move us along now. Thank you, Stuart, for the help. Yeah. Um, lower body challenges. So, again, I'm going to hit this hard. Ball first doesn't matter. Um, we hear this all the time in probably every game that we referee, but I got the ball first. Doesn't matter. If the contact that happens after the ball is played is unfair, then it's still a foul. The most common, and we'll see these when we look at videos, is a player wins the ball and then sticks their studs into somebody's foot or ankle or leg or who, who knows what else. That's still a foul. So just because we get the ball first doesn't mean we're, we're free to do whatever we want after that. If I kick the ball away and punch somebody in the face, it doesn't excuse me punching somebody in the face. So that's a, a consideration we need to really hit strong. Unfair contact is unfair contact regardless of the ball. 
And that's the sentence you'll want to use on the field if somebody says, when I got the ball first. Well, hey, a foul is still a foul regardless of get the ball first. Unfair contact is still unfair regardless of the ball. Who initiates the contact is really important. We're going to see a video here of a low body foul in a minute where a player goes down a little awkwardly, but as a result of contact that that player initiated. And so we have to be really careful when calling fouls that we're not punishing players who didn't actually initiate or create any of the contact. So if a player runs into another player, that's their fault, not necessarily the fault of the other player. We're not going to call foul on player B when player A initiates all the contact. Um, there are rare situations where that's not the case, but broadly speaking, if somebody initiates contact, it's very likely we're gonna call a foul against the other person. Um, so let's dive into some videos then and that we're gonna sort of get progressively more interesting as we go. Play that one more time for you. So on the surface of it, it looks like he gets the ball and then makes some contact with the player. We're going to get a replay of it now. And what you can see here is the white player actually moves the ball away and the, left, the, the blue player catches him on the ankle as he goes by. So this is important for us to be able to perceive the, the, the minor difference in this contact here. But as you can see, it's the white player who kicks the ball away and then takes the contact first. So that kind of motion, that kind of body positioning from a defender needs to raise red flags for us because he's down at the feet with both legs, the ball's gone, and then he catches the opponent on the ankle with both feet. So that's something that we definitely need to be sensitive to. Here in this play, even if the blue player is the one who's kicked the ball away, the sheer body position of his cleats means that that's gonna be unfair contact. That right there is something, a screenshot that we need to remember. Anytime we see a player coming in on the ankles of a player like that, that's going to be unfair contact because the bottom of the shoe is going to hit the, the ankle or the leg uh, and it's going to potentially cause some damage. So as we work through our considerations on this one, does the player show a lack of attention or consideration? Yes. Does the player show uh, or, or act without precaution? Um, does the player make unfair contact? Absolutely. Is there complete disregard of the danger? Not necessarily complete disregard, but there is some disregard for this. Does the challenge put an opponent in a dangerous situation? Yes, because the way they've come in with the bottom of the studs exposed has the potential to create danger for the player here with the contact to the ankle. So this is one that we want to make sure we're paying attention to when we're calling a foul. Same with this one. Oops, pardon me. Doesn't look like there's a lot in that one. I'm gonna play it again for you from here. And which I want you to really pay attention to on this clip is the referee's positioning here. This is not a positioning webinar, but we'll talk about it for a moment. From this distance and from this angle, the referee's not able to judge what actually happens here. And so when we fast forward a little bit and we watch the replay, Doesn't seem there's like there's a lot in it, but when you freeze frame it, the purple player actually goes through the leg of the red player to make that challenge. So while it looks like they play the ball, they've actually gone through the leg first. And so the consideration here is, does the player touch the ball after making contact with the opponent? And the answer is yes here. The player goes through the leg of the opponent and then plays the ball. And if I can get the right freeze frame, you can see the impact that it has on the player. Right there's the moment of contact. She actually kicks her on the outside of the ankle. 
before getting to the ball. So that's the kind of subtlety that we have to be watching for in our foul selection. Because oftentimes we see a couple players go together for the ball, the ball pops away, and we think, okay, that's clean contact. But when we look at it more closely, and if we put ourselves in a position to see it, this is actually unfair play. So I want to go back and watch it in real motion. And how many times do we see this in a game? It looks like the, the purple player pokes the ball away from the red player, no problems. Red player's down, we don't really know why. But having an appropriate position to be able to pick up on this detail right here is really important. And I want you to pay attention to the red player's ankle as she goes down because as she's running, she's about to put her foot down when the purple player kicks her and it causes her ankle to distend and her knee a little bit as well and it actually causes an injury here. The player actually has to come out of the game for a short while as a result of this somewhat innocuous challenge. So watch the way her leg falls after the challenge and the pop of the knee. Whoops, sorry. Those are all things that we have to be very, very sensitive to. Watch the way her leg comes down after she's kicked. That right there, the pressure on the knee, the turn of the ankle, all are a direct result of the player making somewhat subtle contact to the outside of the ankle. So we have to be really, really heightened aware as two players come together that A, we're in a position to see the challenge, because I'll tell you from right here, this referee has no idea that the player just kicked her and in fact doesn't call a foul on this play. And the player who is one of the top players in the NWSL has to come out of the game for a little while. Uh, and I'll, we'll hit play and we'll see the, the frustration of the coach here. It's actually my, one of my favorite people in the NWSL. You can see this coach, how upset he is. Because he knows from where he was at that this has been an unfair play. And he's upset about it, and rightfully so. So positioning and making sure that we can see these subtle contacts is really important. Now we're going to get into some challenges where the ball is won first, and we have to decide if unfair challenge has been committed. So again, another play where the ball is won, kicked away. But what, happened ap excuse me, what happens afterwards, we have to pay attention to. So I'll freeze frame it on the moment of truth here. Kicks the ball away, no problem. But then the end result is that the studs are on the inside and the top of the foot. She comes down with her studs on top of the foot. And so we have to really make sure that we're careful of the outcomes of these challenges because on the surface of it, at that moment, it's clean because she knocks the ball away. She's not trying to get into the player. She's just honestly trying to get the ball away. But the outcome when she stretches is that her extended lunging studs go into the side of the ankle and end up on top of the foot. And so we have to put ourselves in positions to be able to see that clearly and know what the outcome is. And there are hints at that. Because what does the red player immediately do? Grab and hold the ankle. So we have to be sensitive to those kind of challenges. Again, let's watch it in real time. You can see the top of the foot on the top of the ankle. That really hurts for those of you that have never had studs driven into your ankle before. Right there, you can see the bottom of the shoe on the whole side of the ankle. That's painful. So those are the kinds of things, even though the ball's gone first, that we have to be sensitive to and we have to start calling as fouls. And the last one here is just a little awkward, but it's still funny to me. I want to show this video. It's hard to see what happens here, but you get a sense of it. The player in the black uniform comes through, kicks the ball, but the follow through puts his studs in the middle of his stomach. Now, at the moment of truth here, referee doesn't see much in that. AR is going to have a hard time judging that one. So it's going to be hard to see that. But this is where we have to get into the considerations again. 
Does the player show a lack of attention or consideration when making that challenge? Is this dark player at all concerned about where his follow through is going to take him on this challenge? No. Does the player act without precaution? Yes. Does the player make fair or unfair contact with the opponent after touching the ball? Yes, absolutely unfair contact. Is there a complete disregard? Yes. Are there a disregard for consequences? Yes. Is the ball played in a fair manner? Yeah, it is. The initial ball is played in a fair manner, but it's what happens after the play that we have to really be aware of. And we can see just by the way the player goes into that challenge uh, that we're going to have a potential problem because they're running at a high rate of speed directly at the opponent and sort of jumps into the player. So regardless if you can see exactly where the cleats are at that moment, the fact that he's jumping into the challenge after the ball is gone needs to be a red, a red flag for us. It needs to be a warning sign. So even if you don't have a really clear view, you need to be sensitive to challenges that are committed in that kind of nature with that kind of speed, jumping into players, uh, particularly after a ball has been kicked away. At a higher level, more advanced level, we talk about where on the field this happens. This is right in front of the technical area. Coach jumps up immediately. He's yelling. He's upset. These are things we need to be sensitive to because nothing good ever really happens in front of technical areas or in front of benches. So we have to be careful with this. But here is a, a primary example of a play where he could have gone and just kicked the ball. He could have kicked it, stayed on his feet, no problem. But instead, he jumps into the player afterwards and creates a lot of extra contact that was not necessary. So that's where judging what happens after the ball is played is really important. We're going to look at another clip here where we talk about what happens after the ball is played. And Stuart, let's get a volunteer to talk about this clip once we've played it. So if you want to volunteer to unmute yourself and help us talk about this clip, raise your hand. Stuart will select somebody. Let's watch it first. All right, who wants to talk us through this one? Stuart, get us a volunteer. Let's see, it looks like Matt Weed was the first person. So if you can unmute yourself, there you go. All right, Matt, what are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at a defender uh, defending their area. Um, she gets the ball. I would call foul against Blue. Um, she gets the ball, and, and Blue basically kind of goes through her without – even getting to the ball, I don't think. Maybe it rebounds off her knee, but um, I think the defender has the right to uh, defend her zone, uh, gets the ball, you know, is stretching out a little bit from this angle. Um, and yeah, Blue's coming through knee first, body into uh, White, who just cleared it. Okay. Does anybody else want to volunteer and give us some other considerations in here? Matt, that's a good analysis to start. Anybody else want to volunteer and talk us through what they're seeing? We got uh, Nabil Ali. All right, Go let's hear it. Unmute yourself with the bot. There you go. Uh, hey, guys. I, I, I would call it against the red because what happens afterwards, she runs with her knee into the, into the blue team's into the blue, to the blue team's legs, taking her down. So, so you think you follow through? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you, Nabil. Uh, anybody I, else want to raise their hand and volunteer? I could throw a pull out if you want, Matt. No foul and direct, direct penalty. No, nah, that's all right. Let's just have okay. one, more, one or two more people. Okay, sounds good. We'll do uh, Antonio Vargas. All right, Antonio. Go ahead and unmute yourself. What do you got? This one for me right, uh, um, is a little bit tricky because – Sure, the white player gets the ball, but the unnecessary height of the leg is concerning because it's at knee level, not necessarily ankle level. Okay, um, that's a good consideration. So even that's though makes the, even though she makes the attempt two seconds before, the follow through with the boot high and even the follow through with the right leg, just the blue player has no place to go. You can't stop that quickly. It's like within half a second. Okay, so, so let me ask this question. Thank you, Antonio. I appreciate it. Let me ask this question. Is this uh, a natural play on the ball 
for the, the white player. Is this a tackle or is this a clearance? At that moment in time, is that a tackle or is that a clearance? Let's have a raise of hands. If everybody click raise your hands if you think that's just a clearance. If that's a clearance, raise your hand. Stuart, what's that look like? We got about 90 people is what we're hovering about. All right. At 150 that are here. Perfect. So talking through this clip, this is a, a little bit of a difficult clip because all the clips we've been talking about beforehand have been talking about what it looks like after the ball gets played. The thing that we have to look at here is the player doesn't come with much speed other than what is necessary to kick the ball away. She actually just kicks the ball away here. And what happens afterwards is not a tackle. She goes straight to ground after that. She falls right down to the ground after that. She doesn't come through with a lot of force and wipe the player out. So this is actually not a foul on anybody. This is just a very normal play in the game. Because, yes, while the leg is high, the leg is not high when the challenge is committed. The leg is high because, like anybody kicking a ball, when you follow through, your leg swings up a little bit. That's just a clearance. That's not a tackle. That's not a slide. That's not anything. That's a clearance made while reaching for the ball. Nobody's in danger here when this challenge is made. If anything, the blue player creates a little bit of contact by coming into the space of the red player, but it's not unfair. There's nothing unfair about this contact from either player. This is a very normal play. Now, if the white player scissors with the right leg, then maybe we have something different. If the blue player is over here and after the follow through with the leg, she plants her boots into the side of her leg, then we have something different. But this here, is two players coming together with very, very little force after a ball has been cleared legally. The player doesn't go through her. She goes straight to ground after she clears this ball away. She, you see here, she's going to fall just basically straight to the ground, which means there's not a lot of force in that. She goes straight to ground. The blue player is coming into the same space, which she has the right to do also. But there's not a foul here from anybody. And so the thing we need to be really thinking about is, again, the considerations. Does the player show a lack of attention or consideration when making this challenge? Absolutely not. She goes right at the ball. She kicks the ball. At that moment of the challenge, this is perfectly safe. There's no lack of attention being shown. Does the player act without precaution? No, because she doesn't do anything with the dangerous parts of her body, the arms, the studs, to create any problem for this blue player. Does the player make fair or unfair contact with the opponent? This is fair challenge. This is a fair contact. The, the cleats aren't involved anywhere. There's a little bit of the thigh, but women tend to play with a low, with lower center of gravity, so their hips and their thighs come together more frequently. Does the player act with a complete disregard for the danger? No, there's no danger here. Does the player act with complete disregard for consequences? No, she just plays the ball. Does the player have a chance of playing the ball in a fair manner? Absolutely. Plays the ball fairly here. Is the challenge putting an opponent in a dangerous situation? No. Does the player touch the ball after making contact with the opponent? No, she plays the ball first. So if we walk through each one of those considerations, we'll find that this is leaning towards a more fair challenge. Anybody dispute that analysis after having gone through the considerations? Go ahead and raise your, your hands if you do. And we can talk it through a little bit more. We got Michael Suggs. I'm going to allow you to talk. You Michael, go ahead. Hi, Matt. I was just curious in terms of if, if I recall correctly, the blue player ended up on top of the white player. Mm -hmm. um, and in that scenario there, even though the challenge might have been or the contact might have been legal, what if the ball ricochets and then goes back towards the goal and the fact that the, white, the blue player was on top of the white player uh, interferes with the play essentially even would that would you look at that in terms of uh, some kind of issue sure that, that's a good question so let me um, Michael stay unmuted let me ask you uh, uh, a different question do players sometimes end up on top of players because they received a slide tackle yes and do we call a foul on that player who through no fault of their own ends up on top of another player briefly as a result no so this is a very similar situation to that. If the white player's body isn't there, the blue player probably doesn't go to ground at all, right? 
Right. So the blue player goes to ground as a result of some of the contact that happens fairly from the white player. And so if the ball ricochets right back into this, neither of them have done anything wrong in this situation. And so that the blue player perhaps ends up on top of the white player, she hasn't done anything to create that, right? So we talked about a minute ago who creates the contact. So here it's the white player who creates the contact, though it is fair. We can't then punish the blue player for being the recipient of fair contact. Okay, thank Does that you. that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions on this clip? We did have uh, Damon Moody raise their hand, so go ahead and unmute yourself. There okay, you go. Okay, Damon, let's hear it. You guys can hear me. It's, it's not really so much a question, just the, the concept of contact in a contact sport. Sometimes we as referees, I know myself, I get caught up thinking that every time there's contact that there's a foul, but in this case, right away, it looks like it's just two players that happen to incidentally come into contact with each other, but they actually, there, there was never a foul. It's straight clearance when the act happened, they're not even touching. So the incidental contact that happens afterwards is, is through nobody's fault. So that's where I guess you go to the considerations and say it's fair contact, right? Absolutely. And that last part is the important part because to say, you know, yeah, they, they came together through no fault of their own. Um, there wasn't a foul. What we're talking about is the decision-making process for determining if there was a foul. And that's where the considerations really come into play and in determining if any of this contact in here was unfair. And at the end of the day, there weren't studs exposed. There wasn't somebody kicking somebody before the ball or even after the ball. The contact here that happens after the ball is gone isn't unfair. It's the natural coming together of two players in a contact sport. And making that determination is what is really important um, because the blue player has the right to come and reach for this ball. She doesn't create any unfair contact with the white player. The white player kicks the ball, comes to ground, there's no unfair contact. So this is a, a perfect example of a situation where two players make contact with each other, but, but the contact is fair. And so we're not going to blow the whistle for a foul. Right. Nice analysis, guys. I'm going to go out. I know there were a couple more hands raised, but I'm going to move us along so we can make sure we get through the rest of this stuff. Uh, click on this. All right. Here's the next one. So just for some perspective, so we make sure we know what we're looking at because a lot happens in this, we're looking at this play right here between number 17 red and the player who ends up on the ground. And the thing we want to decide here is does somebody commit an unfair play? So we're going to watch it in real time and then there's a replay that we'll come back to at the end of this clip that allows us to, to see it in more detail. So let's watch this contact in, in real time first. So as we can see here, the purple player ends up hurt. We're going to call that purple. I don't know if it's blue or purple, but the purple player ends up hurt. So let's see if there's any unfair contact here. All right. So now we're going to look at the replay of this. And again, it's this interaction here that we're going to look for. So it kind of comes into your screen at the last second, but let's watch for it as it happens. One more time. All right, so let's have a raised hand. Who wants to walk us through the analysis of this? Let's have some new okay. people, folks who we haven't talked yet. Leah Embra, if you can go and hit the unmute at the bottom left, seems you got it. Thanks. Yes, so what it looks like to me is that the red player was blocking the ball, but the blue player still tries to go for it, gets her leg over the ball, and ends up in a very outstretched position where she basically probably just pulls her muscles from, from ending up in an awkward position. But it doesn't look to me that the red player is, you know, injuring the blue player. Okay, good analysis. Let's have another raised hand to support Leah's opinion on this. 
what do we need to be looking for and what considerations are we talking about and what questions are we asking ourselves to determine that the red player hasn't done anything wrong here? Because I want to break down this decision. Somebody we haven't heard from yet. Oh, my bad. Sorry. The hands keep muting. I didn't mean to. Uh, we'll go with Michael Urita. If you guys have your hand up, just keep it up because we can get to you. But we'll All right, Michael, Michael. Let's hear it. Can, can you hear me? I can. Perfect. So I see the red uh, player's hand kind of blocking her, preventing her from going around, which she could have probably got around her uh, had she not been trying to holding her back, which probably took her off balance. I have okay. a follow-up statement uh, regarding it as well. Um, watching the World Cup, I saw so many players faking injuries. When I ref, I, I can't stand that when people fake injuries, when I clearly see it and it just wastes time. So you think this player is not really hurt? It was a two part question. Sorry. Uh, okay. But no, it definitely looks like the red, the first statement I made, uh, the red player holding her back, preventing her from getting around her, which she could have potentially leaped over that leg to get to the ball. All right. So I'm, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. A general um, note when we're on these webinars is let's keep our commentary relevant to uh, the clip that we're watching. So Michael's uh, decision to tell us that he hates it when players fake injury isn't really relevant to this clip at all because this player actually is hurt and it's not relevant to the analysis. Secondly, the hand here at this level of play is very, very normal contact, so that's not a foul. Anybody else want to look at the lower body contact here to support the, the decision that Leah made? Um, with the red player not doing anything wrong here. Somebody we haven't heard from. I'll try Rosemary. Go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, Rosemary, let's hear it. What are, what are we looking at? Um, I think the blue player took a, um, a, a, um, a I mean, she took a chance in extending herself over the red player's leg and put herself in an awkward position and so um, I don't think the red player fouled in this instance, but uh, it, the blue player put herself into that position by, by taking that uh, extra step over the leg and extending herself. Great. Thank you, Rosemary. So the questions that we need to ask ourselves in this play, there's two of them. The first one is, is the ball in playing distance? Because the red player is shielding the blue player away from the ball. And the big thing in this decision is, is the ball in playing distance? Does the red player have the right to be keeping the blue player away from the ball? And the answer to that is yes. The ball is right there. It's going to come to her. It does come to her. So the idea of making yourself bigger to not let your opponent get past you, shielding the ball, is perfectly legal as long as the ball's in playing distance. So if the ball is right here, and the red player reaches her leg out the way that she does and causes the blue player to trip, is that fair? No, it's not, but it's not fair because the ball's not in playing distance. Here, the ball's in playing distance, so the red player has every right to reach her foot out and, and work to, to possess the ball. The second thing that we have to be looking for here is who actually initiates this contact. Now, if the blue player is coming in to get the ball and the red player slams their leg into the blue player, then we're looking at something different. But here, if we back it up, you can see just as the clip is starting that the red player has her leg out to receive the ball and the blue player kicks the back of the red player's leg, which causes her to trip and stumble up. So in this situation, the blue player initiates the contact. And that's what we talked about earlier is we have to make sure we're noticing who actually initiates the contact when a play occurs. And in this situation, if the blue player chooses not to try to come over or through the red player to win this ball, then nothing really happens. She could have stood her up, possessed, no problem. And instead she tries to get past her, she initiates the contact. And then as Leah uh, analyzed, ends up stretched out over the ball, goes to ground in a very uncomfortable way, hurts herself. So the red player actually hasn't done anything unfair here, which is why we don't call a foul against the red player. Um, there's a possible argument that you could call a foul against the blue player for going through the back of the leg. But as we saw in the video, the red player stays up, keeps the ball and moves on. So we don't need to call a foul here. But the big, the, the two big questions, and again, the thing I want you thinking about 
when you're making decisions about foul contact is who initiates the contact? In this case, it's the blue player. And does the red player have the right fairly to have the leg outstretched to block the path of the, of the blue player? And the answer is yes. So for those reasons, it's not a foul against the red player. That is not unfair contact. Anybody have a question about that analysis? Uh, it looks like we got Joel Cooper has his hand raised, so I'm going to unmute you. All right, Joel. Go ahead and click the unmute button at the bottom left of your screen. I got you, Joel. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yes. You got me? Okay. So how are you, how are you supposed to tell the difference? Um, I'm going to play this quickly. With the red player, I think it's Alex Morgan, might be. Um, when she sticks her leg out there, how are you supposed to tell the difference so quickly between blocking the path of the player, causing the blue player to go into her, mm -hmm. fell on red, versus, you know, the her having her leg out and then it actually being blue running into her, causing the contact on red. So sure. that's yeah. what I'm kind of confused about is blocking the path so it's a foul on red versus blue running into red so it's a foul on blue. Absolutely. That's a very good question. I'm going to go ahead and mute you, Joel. So the first consideration is who creates the contact. So that's the first thing we have to look. So this is the order of decision making. First is who creates the contact. Here it's clear that the blue player has kicked or you know, drags the leg about across the back of the red player. So the blue player initiates the contact in this play. And again, if it's a situation where the red player uh, sticks the leg into the side of the blue player, thus initiating the contact, we're talking about a completely different analysis. But here, the red player is, has the contact come into her towards the back. So the next phase of the decision becomes, does the red player have the right to be blocking the path of the blue player in this moment. And that's what all comes down to the ball being in playing distance. So once again, if the ball's five yards away and the blue player is trying to run towards it and the red player just sticks her leg out, that's tripping because the ball's not in playing distance. Here, the ball's at the feet of the red player. So the red player has the right to have their legs out to shield. And so that's where the second phase of the decision and the proximity of the ball is the ball in playing distance. And when you freeze frame this, the red player has basically got the ball at her feet, which means she can make her, big, her body wider, broader, and actually make sure the player can't get past her because you're allowed to do that when the ball's in playing distance. Can and I, so, the, yeah, go ahead. So, so then are we, are we supposed to assume then that any time a player, a ball is within playing distance, if, a def if a, say, the red player in this situation, any time the ball's in playing distance, would we assume that sticking her leg out like that, is, even if it's an open space a few yards from blue and blue goes into her, we're so, we assume that if it's in playing space that red will always be in the clear with that she, assuming she, that she has enough space and she's within playing distance, so it would always be on blue who would be fouling her if it's like this playing distance situation that she basically has the right to put her leg there assuming she's like doing a fair shield or something like that absolutely that's correct you know if the red player's got the ball at her feet and she puts her leg out to turn or to shield or to whatever and someone comes in the back of her and, and hits her and red doesn't initiate that contact then yes that's the red player's prerogative to keep her body around the ball the way that she wants you know if the red player has the ball at her feet and turns around and kicks somebody in the leg that's different because now the red player is initiating that contact. If the red player steps over the top of the ball and stomps on somebody, that's different because the red player is initiating contact. But here the red player is not initiating contact, which is why the order of the decision is what it is. Who initiates the contact? Great. So it's the blue player, not the red player. Now, if, again, if the red player shut, you know, uh, throws her leg out and kicks her while she's got the ball at her feet, the red player has initiated the, con the contact. We've got a different story. But here, the red player is not initiating contact. The blue player is. And then we have to decide, does the red player have the right to have her leg there? And the answer is yes, absolutely, as long as the ball's in playing distance. All right, thanks. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to move us on to the next clip. I think we've talked that one thoroughly enough. Um, the last one, and this is the, the big one we're going to talk about with, with whether or not the player has um, – uh, the ability to, to fairly play the ball without any repercussion for the opponent. So here we go. Whoops. Sorry. So I'm going to play that one more time.
So the thing that we're looking for is, does the white player commit an unfair challenge here? I know the white player ends up getting hit in the nose by the, by the boot. That's not what we're worried about in this clip. We're worried about, does the white player, when they make this slide tackle, is this a fair challenge? Um, so uh, because we're, we're starting to run out of time and I want to get to upper body fouls, I'm going to lead the analysis on this one. The things we need to be thinking about are the nature in which this challenge was committed. So as you can see here, it's hard to tell a little bit, but those are the bottoms of the player's studs. So the player's coming into this challenge with the studs exposed, going towards the leg or into the leg of the player, doesn't go over the top of the ball, stays behind the ball, is probably legitimately trying to win the ball, but is still committing this tackle in a way that shows a lack of attention or consideration for the opponent, a lack of precaution for the opponent, a disregard for consequences to the opponent. And so what we wanna be looking at, and it's actually before this, is one of the key factors. Look at how early the player goes to ground. At that moment, the player is already going to ground. They're already committing the tackle. The reason this is a challenge is because the ball is still moving across the field. Now, if the player's got the ball sitting there with the ball at his feet and the player comes in from this distance to make a challenge, no problem. But the red flag in this play is that does this player have any ability whatsoever when they go to ground? Because right now they're got, they've gone to ground. They have no idea where the ball is going to end up. And that's dangerous. So in this moment, look at where the right leg is pointed. That player is guessing that the ball is going to get there and that's where the tackle is going to end up. If the player, if the blue player here takes a step and traps the ball with the right foot instead of letting it come across, this tackle goes on to the plant foot and possibly breaks the leg of this opponent. So by the mere fact that the ball is not where the tackle is going and the player is guessing and hoping that it gets there is what makes this challenge dangerous for the opponent. And so, again, I want to I analyze the difference. If the player has the ball sitting at his foot when the, player, when the white player starts to go to ground, this white player knows exactly where the ball is going to be and knows where that challenge needs to go to do it safely. This is a speculative challenge. By going to ground before the ball gets anywhere near the opponent, this white player has no idea whatsoever where that ball is going to go, but they've lost control of their body. At this point, this player has no ability to pull out of this challenge whatsoever. And so this challenge, whether this player wants it or not, is coming through here. And if the ball never gets there or if it's mistimed, this is a very, very dangerous challenge for the opponent as you can see, the way they go through the challenge. Going to ground with both feet, going through the player, the end result, the end location of this challenge, when you see the speed of it, that's where the ball ended up. That's where the ball should have been. Look where his feet are. He goes a solid two yards through the player when making this challenge. So whether he gets the ball or not, the way this challenge is committed is dangerous for the opponent and thus needs to be called a foul. Does anybody not understand that analysis? Now's the time to put the hand up. Okay, we got uh, Mitchell Marcus. Go ahead and unmute your mic. I'll do that for you, Mitchell. Go ahead. He's, he's still got to hit the prompt. Okay. So it should be in the bottom left-hand corner. There you go. Can you, can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Mitchell. Okay. Oh, so uh, I understand the analysis. Um, as as explained, uh, I think my question then became: Is what is the foul? Is this a yellow or a red? So we're not talking about fouls and misconduct right now. What we're talking about is how to identify the foul. So okay. what what the guidance at this level is this this is a caution this is a reckless challenge it's reckless okay. because the mode and the point of contact are not um severe enough to be read so when we do another seminar next week if you all want to join this one on misconduct then that's a different story we're talking about the analysis of what's the outcome of the challenge the outcome of this okay. challenge is the player jumps Appreciate out that. of the way 
the mode of contact isn't with the bottom of the feet. The point of contact is not in a dangerous place. And so as a result, it's just a reckless challenge. If this same tackle comes through and actually makes contact with the ankle, then we're seeing red here because it's made with two feet. It's the bottom of the studs and it hits the opponent because there's no contact with the opponent with a dangerous part of the body. It's just a yellow card. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else not sure about the analysis of this challenge and why it needs to be a foul, regardless if the player wins the ball or not, but you can see here, he actually wins the ball. Anybody else not, not clear on this one. Okay, good. 